Hi, good morning. I am Alain Confio. I am the director of the Institute. And it is my honor and pleasure to uh, welcome you all here. Uh, there are many old friends here, some even from uh, Beersheba. The reason I'm mentioning it is because I was asked if the weather is my fault. <laughs> That's New England. And we are lucky because you know it would be. <laughs> So it's wonderful to see all of you. I still remember distinctly the, when I finished reading Vital Eleven when it came out in uh, Georgia. I was then finishing my own dissertation and possibility and uh, the sense, the distinct sense of revelation, of uh, courage. And of a book that um, makes you feel unstable in the best sense of the word. Um, so I feel honored, and this institute feels honored, that you all gathered here to um, honor and the book. I'd like to thank, first of all, Jonathan Scully. Mark Gilbert, who organized this, especially Jonathan was here, very instrumental, of course. And you know, there are not so many. I'd like to thank all of you uh, that who are on the program. So, Manuela Gelov, who's going to bring out with the Goiter, the book that Mark is going to edit, The Legacy of Fort Kruger and the End of Auschwitz Century. Sandy Gilman, Agnika Kanyas. Karen Machtans, Karen Wammer, and Alfred Siegel, I mean all old friends. And I want also to thank Paz Goldstein, who is not here now, but please tell him that I thanked him, because he is the real force behind all this. Uh, so thank you for coming. I'm very happy and I'm looking forward to our deliberations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alon. Um, I'm John Pitskolnik. I teach German studies here at the UMass Amherst. Um, it's my honor to welcome you all um, and to open uh, this symposium, um, uh, The Legacy of Kluger and the End of the Auschwitz Century, uh, 30 years after Vaitar David. Um, uh, the impetus of the symposium comes uh, from a typical organizer, uh, Professor Mark Gelber, um, uh, and the occasion is um, to launch um, a, 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 this book, um, uh, most of which we borrowed the title of this symposium from, adding 30 years since uh, Roger Lady. This symposium um, uh, marks time in a number of different ways. Um, uh, this book uh, comes out one year after a hope to have taken place, but nonetheless virtually realized <laughs> conference um, uh, a, a little more than one year ago uh, that was to be um, held um, uh, on the one year anniversary of the passing of Ruth Kluger, um, uh, Mark her York site in 2021. 20, uh, the book is now here, uh, and we'll have a panel later today uh, that will um, uh, record uh, and upload uh, discussing the book um, uh, and its contributions. Um, uh, the, concept, the end of the Auschwitz century, the concept of the Auschwitz century um, uh, is, um, as readers of the book will learn, um, coined by one of the contributors to the volume, uh, Johann Edelberg Leonard, um, uh, who uses this term Auschwitz century to describe the time uh, of, of lived experience of the survivors of the Holocaust. Um, uh, and um, uh, that question of time, marking time, um, uh, uh, thinking about a survivor, memoirist, um, uh, activist, public figure um, uh, like Ruth Kluger uh, and um, uh, her legacy, her legacy um, uh, in multiple ways um, uh, is what um, uh, the symposium will, will address from in the first ways. We have a roster of distinguished guests and I'd like to thank all of our uh, distinguished guests um, uh, for uh, generously uh, uh, donating uh, their uh, time and traveling um, uh, many of you considerable distances uh, to come here um, uh, in person uh, for this um, uh, symposium. Um, and I'd like to thank um, the 
sponsors of this symposium for their generous support. Uh, the Institute for Holocaust Genocide Memory Studies at UMass Amherst, uh, the Austrian Cultural uh, Forum, who made possible uh, the travel of uh, a director, uh, Renata Schlittkunz, um, um, from Vienna uh, to come to this conference. Um, the Department uh, of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures at UMass Amherst, the program uh, in German and Scandinavian studies, um, uh, and the Department of Judaic and Near Eastern Studies um, uh, all generously uh, supported uh, our symposium. Um, we'll hear um, from a number of uh, well, for three uh, distinguished keynote speakers and then um, uh, a panel uh, of three scholars uh, who will uh, discuss uh, the book volume. And we'll hear uh, them reflect on the legacy of Ruth Kluger in different ways as a survivor memoirist, um, uh, but also um, as a, a colleague. Um, uh, or a mentor, uh, uh, a friend, um, uh, also as a poet, uh, and as a public figure, uh, a feminist, um, uh, and even as a celebrity, as some of the discussion um, uh, yesterday addressed. Um, and so now it's my um, uh, honor uh, to introduce um, uh, two of our especially distinguished and valued um, guests, Ruth Kluger's uh, sons, uh, uh, Percy Angris and uh, Dan Angris, who will come to say a few words to open this motion.
felt uh, connected to America as her uh, as part of her identity, and she understood uh, the American audience. So fast forward to today, here we are concerned about the demise of democracy in the U.S. She would have held court on this topic. So um, I think it's it's very apropos. So I was with her in 1989 when she was recovering from her head injury, and I think most of you are familiar with the history of how this book was written, but she, if you're not, she was in a, in a bicycle accident, um, went into a coma, when she uh, recovered from the coma, after 10 days, um, a lot of repressed feelings came up, which led to, uh, that became accessible, and thus, Vita Leibniz was, uh, was born, and, and she began writing. Um, but throughout my childhood, while never evoking the cliche, we must never forget, she encouraged thoughtful reflection on world events, from the Vietnam War to human rights and justices to basic equality in the U.S. She taught me to think and push back and question, and if necessary, fight back. And on the flip side, her love of words was a mainstay in her house. Uh, the New York Times crossword puzzles were strewn everywhere, along with the German quarterly. <laughs> Recitation of poems from memory, but also a curiosity in my personal interests, including sports, which you could care less about, were helping me address the emotions of a 16-year-old's first love and breakup. Um, it's somewhat ironic that Riker Levin is as much a mother-daughter story as it is a survival story, yet she ended up with two boys as her adult challenge. Um, like all of us, she was flawed, stubborn, often emotionally unavailable, and dismissive. But her contributions to the field of Jewish studies, German and comparative literature, and Holocaust studies, specifically her influence on literary analysis, and, and though she mentored in the U.S. and abroad, will hopefully be her legacy for generations to come. Um, since this is Emily Dickinson country, I wanted to leave you with a poem that is on my mother's gravestone. She loved Emily Dickinson. Uh, very short poem. Uh, to make, it's called The Make a Prairie. Some of you may know it. Uh, it goes like this. To make a prairie, it takes a clover and one bee, one clover and a bee, and reverie. The reverie alone will do if these are few. Now, I love this poem for a whole host of reasons, but um, I'll be the first to admit, I had to look up the word reverie, and reverie is a great word, and it captures how I will always remember her. The, the, the definition of reverie is a state of being pleasantly lost in one's thoughts, a daydream. And, and it's her thoughts that, that kept her alive. It's, it's the, her thoughts that, that led her to be able to compose and, and write and, and critique and get other people to think. And so it's just, to me, perfect for how we'll remember her um, when we look at her grave. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry? I'll speak. It'll yes, pass. Now, now introducing um, uh, Percy Andrews, please. Uh, Dan touched on one of the things that uh, I wanted to talk about, the neat thing I wanted to talk about, which is my mother's engagement of us as kids in what we would eventually learn as a world of politics. And the point, both he and I wanted to give you a perspective that you're not going to get from uh, her scholarly uh, writings. Uh, or by uh, basically, I was raised with the knowledge of what happened to her and a sense that what you do in the world matters and what's happening in the world matters. And um, this must have sunk in uh, early because I recall being somewhere between five and seven and seeing a helium balloon. Some of you will have heard this story, forgive my petition. Uh, a helium balloon in a Woolworths store. This was around 1963, and I wanted the balloon. I said, would you buy me a balloon? And she said, no, I can't buy you the balloon because this store is forbidding black people to sit at their lunch counters in the South, and we're boycotting it. We're not giving them our business. And I got it because of how she had raised us. It was, it was okay, that makes sense. I'll, I'll skip the balloon. And this continued throughout our lives. So age 12, uh, we were still in the Bay Area, um, and she said, I'm going to a peace march. Um, and we talked about it, she said, would you like to come? And I said, okay, yeah, that's, that sounds good. Uh, and we went to Berkeley and went to one of the early anti-war demonstrations. 
um, marching from Berkeley to the Oakland border, if I recall correctly. And it was, for me, exciting, but it was also something that I understood. There was a war going on against people who probably really weren't our enemies, and we were mixing civilians with enemy soldiers, and we were supporting a dictatorship, and this was really not a good thing for America to be doing. I got, got that and developed more understanding of it as I got older. Uh, a couple of years later, I wrote a letter to uh, the newspaper in Cleveland that was published where I was defending uh, Muhammad Ali's uh, resistance to being uh, drafted. Um, and that same period, she took us to Washington to a major anti-war demonstration, uh, which Norman Mailer wrote about famously in Armies of the Night. Uh, and this was all part of, of our upbringing. And I don't know whether it's nature or nurture, but I am a politics junkie. And in later life, used to, one of the things we would always talk about first if we were meeting a person or talking on the phone was the latest in politics. And I still, to this day, um, sometimes am inclined to pick up the phone and say, you know, what do you think we just happened last week? And of course, <coughs> of course I can't. Uh, and I'm going to leave it at that, just a short um, statement about how meaningful it was to me to grow up with someone who was that conscious of what was happening elsewhere in the world and that vocal about uh, calling out wrongs which she saw. Finally, um, to open the conference, I'd like uh, to uh, introduce uh, Manuela Gerloff um, from the Reuter Press, um, uh, who's published this month. Ladies and gentlemen, dear editors and authors, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you today. Thank you so much for having me here and giving me the opportunity to say a few words as the publisher of this important selection of essays which were the inspiration for this symposium. For those who don't know me yet, my name is Manuela Gerloff, that was mentioned before. Um, I'm the head of the humanities and social sciences teams at De Reuter, and I just relocated from our headquarters in Berlin to our office in Boston. And um, I'm so pleased that this gave me the opportunity to take this short trip to Amherst and attend today's special event. Also, on behalf of my Berlin colleagues who unfortunately can't join us today, I would like to emphasize that we are extremely honored to, that we were chosen to publish the volume on Ruth Kruger's legacy and the end of the Auschwitz century. It's a truly outstanding publication offering substantial contributions on and from the manifold perspectives which her writings helped to bring into focus. From a memory studies perspective, this is kind of my field, um, when I was an academic a long time ago, I find it particularly appealing that the contributions also include autobiographical references and insights from scholars who knew Ruth Kluger personally, and I really appreciate the family insights um, you've been sharing um, since last night. Um, we are convinced that through our interdisciplinary publishing program, namely in history, German literature, and Jewish studies, this publication will reach a broad readership in order to continue the legacy of Ruth Kluger also beyond the end of the Auschwitz century. Please allow me briefly. Um, uh, please allow me to briefly outline why the context the Reuter offers is um, so fitting. With almost 100 publications, one of our outstanding book series in Jewish studies, Conditio Judaica, co-edited by Mark Gelber, has just celebrated its 30th anniversary. It ideally represents the international and interdisciplinary approach we take at the Reuter. In the field of history, most of you are probably familiar with our 16th volumes edition, The Persecution and Murder of the European Jews by Nazi Germany, which was published in close cooperation with Yad Vashem and is currently being translated into English. And five um, out of these 16 volumes are already available. 
and uh, were adapted for an anglophone um, audience. There's, of course, also our rich literary and cultural studies program in the field of German and Austrian um, literature, the area in which Ruth Krüger herself has published as a scholar and in which she has now become the subject of research. <clears throat> in addition to the volume discussed today, we have seven other publications on Ruth Krüger in our program and it comes with no surprise that the keynote speakers of this event are no strangers to us. What a pleasure. <laughs> and last but not least, please allow me to draw your attention to the book series, Perspectives on Jewish Texts and Contexts, edited by Vivian Liska, in which the collection we present today appeared as the 20th volume. We are especially grateful to Mark Gelber as the editor of the volume, The Legacy of Ruth Krüger, who by choosing these readings and findings has provided us with yet another valuable contribution toward a better understanding of the work and life of this remarkably multifaceted Holocaust survivor, author, scholar, and feminist. Many thanks also to the contributors to this volume, many of whose works I've admired since I wrote my dissertation quite a long time ago. Thank you so much for generously offering your time and expertise to this project. I'm very much looking forward to attending the symposium and I'm curious about the insights that will be shared and I very much hope that our exchange may possibly turn out to be the starting point for further joint projects. We at Devoida would be on it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so um, we'll no longer be recording um, uh, the upcoming keynote um, uh, addresses, um, and uh, we're just going to go right into that. Thank you.